Hey, thanks for that. And thanks for bringing to mind a really positive memory. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you here today, and what a beautiful facility. So congratulations to the church family for accomplishing this under God's direction. This is a really very special place. Yeah, Auburn, those were the days, and, and back before then, Tacoma Southside, we, we, we got around once upon a time. I remember my little boy was in a stroller. He's now 21. So that was uh, when we were in Tacoma the first time. I uh, wore a younger man's clothes back in that day. Uh, what an inspiring service this has already been. Were you blessed by Janice's baptism? Amen. I hope you were. What a, what a powerful testimony. Uh, baptism, as we know, is not a declaration that we've made it. It's a declaration that we've come to a realization that if we're ever going to make it, we need Jesus in our lives and we accept him wholeheartedly. Thank you, Janice, for that encouragement. Nietzsche, what an awesome presentation earlier. So inspiring. What great encouragement for parents to study the Bible with their kids for kids to share Jesus with others, this astonishing concept of the uh, Christmas program. Man, I'm just thinking, I wish I could be out here to see that. I hope you, that's got to be filmed or streamed or something. That's going to be absolutely stunning. I do want to bring greetings to you from uh, It Is Written. Two things I want to tell you about briefly. If you don't know, we, we have a unique Sabbath school program at It Is Written. It's the only Sabbath school program on the planet where the authors of the Sabbath school lesson are interviewed. So they, we, we teach the lesson, but it's the, the lesson writers that do the teaching. My friend and colleague Eric Flickinger hosts that program. You can find it at our website, itiswritten.tv. Just go down to where it says Sabbath school and click there and you'll find it. It's, it's good. We're told by many people that they're really blessed. It's 30 minutes and people appeal to us and say, would you go for 60 and we smile sweetly and say, no, because that would take twice as much work. And uh, the amount of work that we're doing at the ministry is uh, considerable already. But may, who knows, maybe one day when we figure out we have nothing else to do. But 30 minutes, leave them wanting more, is what we say. So anyhow, if you've got 30 minutes and you want to do some back study for Sabbath school, hear from the authors. Right now it's uh, uh, the Klingbile, uh, the Klingbiles, Dr. Klingbile and her husband, Dr. Klingbeil, and uh, next quarter is going to be Clifford Goldstein. Really, really good uh, uh, studies. And if you don't know about our full-time channel, it is written TV. I hope you'll check it out. We're planning on kicking it up to the satellite sometime soon. That wasn't our original intent. We've been happily occupying an, a digital space for some time uh, on Roku and um, uh, smart TVs, Amazon Fire, Google Play, Apple TV. Uh, and just online at itiswritten.tv, but you'll find we, we started 65 years ago with one television program in English. 65 years later, we have about 10 programs, uh, English, Spanish, and American Sign Language now. So things have grown just a little bit, and you can check out all of that, our special series that we've done over the past year. Uh, you'd be crazy not to know about them, at least. We did Take Charge of Your Health during the pandemic. There's a message, take charge of your health. Um, we interviewed like 23 doctors and lots of people with success stories. It's a terrific series of about seven programs. Uh, we followed that with uh, Answers and Prophecy, I think it was called. It was something like that. And then uh, a revival series called No Limits. Really good, a punchy, powerful revival series. Great for midweek at church or small groups or something similar. Uh, then after that, we did um, Next Level Health and uh, now Connect. That's about prayer in August and then Revelation Today, a full-length evangelistic series in October. You can just watch them online on itiswritten.tv. And they're archived, so if you like to do it at church or at home or watch through it at home or share it with a, a small group, you are able to do that as well. Just a couple of things I wanted you to know about. And I want to just mention this, because if I don't, my wife will ask me why I did not. We have just released a resource called Buried Treasure. It's an evangelism program for kids. It follows along with our children's Bible studies, the My Place with Jesus Bible Guides. So you have Bible study time. There are scripture songs, 20 original scripture songs, 21 in total, but... One wasn't original. We tried to find the author, the writer, the composer. No one knows who wrote it. 
So if you ever hear the songs and say to yourself, oh, I wrote that song, then I would just like to say thank you because <laughs> we borrowed the song, not knowing who to get permission from to use it. So I hope you are as, someone is as forgiving as we were presumptuous. Uh, there's uh, health talks and nature talks and all kinds of cool presentations. It can be used as a vacation Bible school. A family said, we got it. We're doing it at home. We're just doing it at home with our kids as family worship. Okay, we didn't expect that. Or the, the, the primary aim was to use it as an evangelism series. I didn't say an evangelistic series because that connotes sermons and so forth. It's, it's an evangelism program you can use in conjunction with an evangelistic series. So the adults are here, the kids are over there, they're doing buried treasure. So it's a great resource. There's nothing quite like it available. I think you really like it. Well, we're going to pray again and anticipate the blessing of the God of heaven. Let me just make sure I've got the time all figured out. I think I do. Let's pray and expect God's blessing now. Now, Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, grateful. Grateful that there is a God who cared enough to make us, who after we went in entirely the wrong direction, called enough to call us back. When we were stubborn and resistant, you were extravagant enough in your love that you sent your only begotten Son so that whoever should believe in him would not perish, but instead would have everlasting life. Lord, we are grateful you are merciful. We are mindful that the Bible says the long suffering of God is salvation. Lord, look with us or look upon us. We are poor and needy. We are flawed and faulty. We live in a sinful world conspiring against every decision in favor of the gospel. And yet we know that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And so, Lord, grab us, hold us, draw us, keep us, appeal to us. And this morning, speak to us. The Bible says your word is a living word. Let it live in us. And as it is proffered this morning, as it is presented in these minutes, wherever we be, here in this church auditorium, or on an armchair, or a sofa, or at a kitchen table, or on a deck in a church somewhere else. We're asking our Father that you would speak and be heard. Bless us, please, for your glory and not our own. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an odd thing, really. I think an odd thing. I look back over my life, think back to when I was a kid, and I've asked myself several times, what are the things you remember most from your childhood? What are the things you remember most? I grew up in a, a beautiful town, a, a, a hard scrabble blue collar town, uh, way down there in the southern hemisphere in New Zealand. And uh, as I think of my childhood, I think of things like the, the rugby league club, spent so much time there playing football. I think of uh, my, my school, my elementary school, St. Paul's Convent School or Catholic School. I think of the town itself, the two rivers that converge at a place called the Point. We're down the river all the, all the time. Up there, the Hakarimata Ranges, beautiful, uh, uh, an escape, a, a paradisical playground for us there's something else that jumps out and I can't even really explain why and that's the walks that I would take with my mother and father now you think that maybe that means that from a young age all we ever did was walk it was walk walk, walk. but but it really wasn't as I think about it it was at a certain season in my life I don't even recall how old I was at the time but I think I was about 12 and someone would say let's go for a walk and it would typically be in the evenings or maybe a Sunday morning I remember one Sunday morning and we just walk there are wonderful places to walk 
You can walk on both riverbanks. These days, there's a river walk on both riverbanks. You start here, walk down there, get to the other river, walk up here. Back then, it wasn't quite like that, but we could still walk on the riverbanks. I don't know that we ever, we never, I don't believe, ever went up into the, the ranges together. Beautiful. In, in another place, you might call them mountains. They're really, really hills. They max out at 374 meters, 1,220 feet. I guess where I'm from in Tennessee, that'd be mountains. Uh, covered in native bush, native birds gladdening the place with their beautiful songs. But I just remember walking with my parents. I, I, I don't quite know what it was. I remember on one particular day, we went to, the, to the, the foundations of what would become the New World Supermarket and walked across the concrete blocks and a few beams, I guess, or joists or some such thing. And it was, it was I, I guess it was just together time. Maybe it was an opportunity for me to enter into my presence, my parents' world, or, or them to enter mine, or, or maybe the joy of it was that for a moment our two worlds became one. But I remember the walks. We didn't walk ourselves to death. I couldn't even tell you how many times we went on these particular walks. But they were a joy, maybe... Maybe just a reminder now of those halcyon days when things were simpler and life was uncomplicated. Whenever I go to my hometown, I walk. It's just what I do. It doesn't even matter where I go. I just want to walk around and breathe the air and stand at the riverbank and look down to the river. You look, you look down from where we live and Maybe I, just, maybe I just think it's a fantastic place to perambulate. My own children, I'm sure, have memories of walking in my hometown. They've visited down there a handful of times. And on one occasion, I'd been telling my kids about this magnificent bushwalk that I'd never done. You get to the top of the ranges and then walk five or six hours. And it ends at a stand of kauri trees, which are something like sequoias, but not nearly as big. They're a, a magnificent uh, native tree. And the day we did, we might have got away a little late, I don't know, but we didn't give ourselves quite enough time. And we didn't know that the track, the trail was going to be all muddy and a little bit of tough going. I think we walked the last half hour in pitch blackness, hoping we would stay on the trail and not tumble down it into oblivion. It might not have been our finest moment, but I'd like to think that one day when we are gone, my children will remember walking with their parents something like I remember walking with mine. We walk together a lot as a family. Sabbath afternoons, we'll often walk. And it's not a hike. I mean, not really. Uh, our version is a little more leisurely than that on a Sabbath afternoon. But in our part of eastern Tennessee, there are outstanding walks or hiking trails everywhere. If you are prepared to drive 45 minutes or so, and I hate doing that, drive to go walking. I'd rather walk to go walking, but you know what I mean. If you're prepared to drive the better part of an hour, then you're going to be smack dab in the middle of world-class walking with mountains. Well, okay, big hills and rivers. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's a wonderful time for us as a family, for my wife and I to just have that together time and be away from the distractions that the real world offers us. I know you've reflected on this. Jesus was a walker. Amen. He walked. If you look at a map, you'll discover that Capernaum, way up there, not very far from Lebanon today, a city that uh, the Bible refers to as Jesus' own city. He spent a lot of time up there. It wasn't really very far from Nazareth where he was raised. But you know that Capernaum in a straight line is about 80 miles from Jerusalem. And Jesus never once caught the bus. <laughs> Always walked. There's no mention of him traveling by donkey. There weren't too many other options back then in the Middle East. You either walked by donkey the pictures always seem to show the wise men from the east traveling by camel. I suppose that would be an option. But I've never seen too many camels roaming around Israel, at least. We imagine Joseph and Mary walking from Nazareth to Jerusalem for that census back then at the time of Jesus' birth. Jesus was born after a long walk. He was a walker. 
And so you know, and I'm reminding you of this, that our camp meeting theme is, what is it? Walking forward. And I'm saying walking with Jesus. As we are walking forward, we are talking about journeying, of course. Not strolling, not bumbling, not really wandering, but, but journeying through life forward, going where we go with Jesus. And we might want to ask ourselves, to what end? What's the sum total of all of this? What's the point of walking with Jesus? You could be like so many other people who choose to go it alone. You know that there have never been so few people in the United States attending church or a synagogue or a mosque. It's now down below 50% for the first time since records were taken. And we can only imagine, I think, expect or assume that back before records were taken, the numbers were really pretty high. Maybe the whole idea of walking forward with Jesus is a little passe now. But it cannot or should not be. It seems that life only really makes sense if you have a destination in mind. And without a worthwhile destination, it'll make a whole lot of sense. Of course, we are all in the one sense headed to precisely the same destination. That would be the cemetery. But what then? If there's something beyond this life, how do we get there? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 that Christ, Jesus, died for our sins. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. And the Bible states several times that Jesus is or was the propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is, according not only to John the Baptist, but according to John the Baptist and others, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. It is through faith in Jesus that we have the hope of everlasting life. You know something, and this may sober you up. The average life expectancy, no, the life expectancy for an American stands right now at 78.54 years. It's a little sobering. Do the math. That doesn't mean you're damned or restricted only to 78 and a half years, but that's the average life expectancy here in these United States. But God says, I have better for you. And he offers us a life that measures with his life. Now, you might not want that. You may settle yourself with what you get from life on this mortal coil. I would say that would be settling. I wouldn't want what Jeff Bezos has if that's all I was getting. He's spending $28 million to fly in a rocket. He's taken his brother with him. That's $56 million for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, $56 million. That's expensive. <laughs> you may wish to have his, kinds of, his kind of money. I don't know if you ever read about this. Somewhere in Colorado on land Mr. Bezos owns, He's hollowing out the inside of a mountain to build a clock that will tick once a year and chime once every 10,000 years. There's some philosophical, esoteric reason for why he's doing it. But it is, as you might imagine, costing a gargantuan sum of money. It's not for research, it's for vanity. It's not helping the world. It's, I don't know what it's doing. Ticking once every 365 and a quarter days. See, you could have that. You could do that. 
if you wanted to. Now, I will say this. There's nothing preventing a man having that much money and having Jesus as well. That would really be having the best of both worlds. But we've got to want a little more than this world offers. I don't remember much religious instruction that I learned while I was attending St. Paul's Catholic Elementary School, primary school. But the one verse of scripture that I remember was one that changed my life when, as a successful broadcaster, I was considering my future. Would I stay with my career or would I be not only a Christian, but a Christian in a really small church that I'd heard practically nothing about? The nun, Sister Mary Dionysia, did teach us, what does it profit a man if he gains his, the whole world and yet loses his soul? That spoke to me. And I wonder if it speaks to you. What are we pursuing in this world? What are our priorities in this world? A French chef recently did something quite remarkable. He was one of only 27 chefs in France to have a restaurant that has been awarded three Michelin stars. That's currently. Now, a Michelin star, I mean, that's like an Academy Award. That's like the Nobel Prize for chefs. To have three Michelin stars, that means you are the top of the top of the top of the top. But after having three Michelin stars for 20 years, his restaurant was in an out-of-the-way location in a village quite a long way from anywhere. He contacted the Michelin people and asked them, what do I have to do to give these back? He said, I don't want them anymore. He said in an interview with journalists, I know that I will be a lot less famous now, but I don't want them. He said it was time for him to redefine his priorities. For 20 plus years, he'd been living his life from one dish to the next, never knowing when the Michelin judge is going to walk through his door. They would come two or three times a year. He had to be at the top of his game every single time. And after 20 years, he said, I want to do something else with my life. You can get to the top of the mountain and discover the view really isn't very good. That's what had happened for this guy. 20 years of that kind of pressure. He was the elite he had precious few peers. I would be delighted to have him over to my place for dinner. And I wouldn't be too proud to ask him to cook. I would. <laughs> but what have you got when you've got it all, but you still don't have it all? Because all is Jesus. How are your priorities? May I ask you? Do you have what Christ offers you? I'm not very worried, and I'm certainly unimpressed by the size of your house, the, 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 the performance of your stock portfolio, the health of your 401k. These are just things. It's all just stuff. One day, frankly, one soon day, it'll all be gone. And if Jesus doesn't come back, we'll pass off, and it'll all be left to someone else. What then? It's unimportant in the big picture. Oh, no, no, it's okay to have a nice car, nice house, and big bank balance. It's all good. I'm not against that. You know I'm not. But if that's what we're working for, we're working for little or nothing. We're selling our souls at a very cheap price. Instead, the Bible encourages us to make room in our lives for Jesus and to walk forward, not around in circles. I recall being in Jerusalem with a friend. We were filming there, and we were in the old city near the walls, on a wall, I guess. And we said, we're done for the day. Let's go. Do you think we can find our way out of here? Oh, we both said to each other, full of bravado. Yes, of course. We got here. We can get out. And so we left. And you're walking these narrow stone steps and pathways and climbing stairs and back down stairs. It all starts to look the same after a while. And we had walked for, I don't know, was it 20, 25, or 30 minutes, surprised that we weren't outside. And then one of us said to the other, ah, this looks familiar. Why was it familiar? Because we were back where we had started from. We weren't walking forward. We were walking around and around and around. Many of us are like that person rowing in a boat with one oar. I grew up on a river. And so it was just a rite of passage that I would row for the rowing club on the river. 
And, and, and you know, if you're in an eight or rowing boat, they've got a name and it slips me right now. If, if, if the rowers on one side of the craft row and those on the others don't, what happens? If you're in a dinghy or some little boat of some kind, you row with one oar, where do you go? Nowhere really, just around in circles, that's all. And my brother, my sister, my burden is that you are not walking around in circles, but rather walking forward. Jesus takes you forward. Jesus takes you onward. And Jesus takes you upward. The Bible speaks about us growing unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Anything less than that is going around in circles. God wants the best for us. He wants us to walk with Jesus. But it would be a very fair thing for you to ask the question, how do I walk with a Savior who does not live here on the earth? Jesus, 2,000 years ago fully, left this planet under rather remarkable circumstances. The Bible tells us that he is in heaven, and yet we are being urged this week and this weekend to walk with him. This is what? A metaphorical walk? Walk forward, walk with Jesus. He's not here. He is there. How do I walk with Jesus? This is a serious business. God does not want us retreating as Christian believers, but our walk is an advance. It is a forward march. It isn't a hike. It isn't a wander. It isn't a walk in the park. Think about this. Walking forward. I'm manipulating that and saying walking with Jesus, walking forward with Jesus. What does that even mean? Walking forward. It means living in a forward direction. Living with Jesus. It means existing, think about this, existing day to day with Jesus in your life and in your heart. It means a life lived in connection with the God of heaven. I don't want any of us thinking about this camp meeting theme as though it were a slogan, walking forward. I mean, that could mean something or it could mean nothing, depending on what you do with it. Walking forward, what a nice idea. It could be just that, just a slogan. But no, let's not, it be, let's not let it be that. Walking forward, walking with Jesus, that's a challenge. It's something you want to take seriously. Now, I could look at that from another side of the same coin there and say, that's an opportunity. Walking with Jesus. Can you imagine that? What an opportunity to allow Jesus primacy in our lives, to take our faith seriously, to give faith the precedence in our lives that it deserves, yea, verily, that it demands. Jesus is not to be an add-on. we got to understand that. Christ isn't a prosthetic. Jesus isn't uh, uh, an asset of some kind that you bring on board and mix in with all the other stuff in your life. Jesus isn't an afterthought. Read your Bible. I was reading this morning in my own in the book of Hebrews, and it said again, and I stopped and looked, speaking of Jesus who made the worlds. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. Without him, we have nothing and we are nothing. We must have Jesus. We must walk with Jesus and we must walk forward. The Bible challenges us. Paul wrote that we are to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I'm going to read that again because it just sounded like a preacher reading a Bible verse. Now it's going to sound like the Bible. We're going to listen to it. This is what Paul wrote to the Colossians. Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That, my sister, my brother, is walking forward. He goes on, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. The Bible urges us to walk in love, walk as children of light, to walk circumspectly and to walk in truth. And so I'm inviting you 
to walk over to the book of Galatians right now. Open up your Bible or your device or something anyway and look in Galatians and chapter 5. And we're going to read about walking here. This is forward momentum, let me tell you. Galatians and chapter 5 is where we go. Galatians 5. And why don't we start in, I'm thinking, verse 16. Paul writing to the Galatians says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now you could define the lust of the flesh uh, many ways, various ways. Uh, he goes on to, 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 to define that for us, as a matter of fact. He says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would or the things that you want to do. He says, but if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law. We're talking about walking forward, not walking around in circles. Not one step forward, two steps backward. If I were to ask you to be really honest about your spiritual life, you would tell me that it's not all plain sailing. You would probably be honest enough to say that you're not really what you want to be as a believer and that on some level you're disappointed. There would be many here right now who are wondering why they're not getting more out of their Christian experience. I shall tell you this story. I had two individuals come to me in about a three-month period, one in Florida, one in Lincoln, Nebraska, both young men. And one of them said, they both said to me, separate occasions, Pastor, I don't think that I can go to heaven. It was remarkable. Carbon copies, as though the one had recorded the conversation and then was acting the part the second time around. I don't think I can go to heaven. Well, why don't you think you can go to heaven? He said, well, because I've been told that before I can go to heaven, I've got to reach a certain level and I just don't see myself getting there. I'm stuck. I'm a sinner. And it seems like I just can't break out of where I am. I could tell you the rest of the story. I, uh, by the time we're done, you'll figure out where I went with him in that. <laughs> Should I dance? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Not me. When I became an Adventist, I was so glad, man, they don't dance, those people. Thank you, Jesus. Where were we? I don't think I'm good enough to go to heaven. Young man told me. Two young men. I explained to them that of course they weren't good enough to go to heaven. Oh, hey, how you doing? All right. What you got? I've got my marriage to God. Yes. He just told me to speak. Yes. Because I found a spot where it says, and yes, right you tell me. You're at. Yes, you're right where I am. And it says, Yeah, you want me to read it? I have to, put my, I have to put my glasses says, on. But if you're led with the Spirit, yes, yes. you're not under the law. Yes, I just read that. That's fantastic. And I feel in the Spirit of heart where yes. I do want to go with God. His Amen. Way, his will, his want, well, you're in the right place. I've given up all my money where I don't want to go. No, no, no. Well, you just keep on praying. I do want to go the will, the way, the want of God. Exactly. And I totally have seen Jesus and the things of Oh, God. fantastic. He has given me a mission. Well, well you're in the right place. Going out and doing whatever God wants. That's true for all for of us. We need to always have obedience to God. Yeah. And never go anywhere with our flesh. Don't go for our sinuses or anything of how right. feelings of nerves. I got an idea. We need to totally go with how our spirit is. Amen. Our soul inside, how Hello, we feel Emma. it. I've to even been told by totally taking stands, God has even spoke down. We need to be taking things totally out Amen. and going by how God wants it, All right. not of our own wants. i got an idea. What God wants. The his pastor, will, his way, his Pastor want. Mike Demma, we're, we're going to go talk to Pastor Mike Demma a little bit. And I think he wants to pray. As a matter of fact, let me pray for you now, can I? Yes, yes you Right can. now, you've got to tell me your first name. Jessica. All right, we're going to pray for Jessica. Mind if I put my hand right here? All right. Father in heaven, what a blessing to have Jessica here today. And she is hearing your voice, holding her Bible, reading your word, wanting your will to be done in her life. We all want that. And we pray that you would visit Jessica, come close to her, give her a settled peace, and give her day to day the assurance that comes from knowing that she is a child of God. Amen. We thank you and we pray for our sister especially in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you today. Thank you, Jessica. 
So my young friend was telling me, I don't think I'm good enough to go to heaven. And my response to him was, welcome to the club. Who is? No one is. And so we work through that in much the sort of way that we're about to work through it now. So follow me here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Now you're looking at that and you're saying, oh, I'm not into any of that. Witchcraft, hatred, variance. That's just another way of saying contentions. Emulations. Think about that. That's jealousy. Am I ringing your bell anywhere along the line? Wrath. Uh-oh. That's just another way of saying losing your temper. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. Envyings. Up. Oh, that's all of us. Murders. Hopefully that's none of us, but Jesus did say that when you hate your brother or your sister, that's murder. Drunkenness. Revelings and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you see yourself written in there, and we're talking about walking forward, you may think that our theme this week is mocking you. So what do we do about this? Well, we just heard, and my dear sister even reiterated, where the Bible says, walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It says in verse 24, they that are Christ. Oh, no, no, no. Did I go too far? I think I did. Verse 22, here we are. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Here's the kicker. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. My friend, I, it's, it's like finding Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth. It's like finding the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant. I mean nothing blasphemous about that. It's like finding hidden treasure, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but better because we all wrestle with this. We can talk about walking forward all we want, but there's a voice inside of us that says, you're not doing a great job of that. I think we've uncovered something here. We don't want to walk after the flesh. We want to walk after the spirit. You see, God gives to us the Holy Spirit to transform us, remake us, empower us. Hey, get, 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 be careful about that. It's not that now we have power. We are making way for God's power in our life. So that when Jesus is in your heart and he comes to you through the Holy Spirit, you're now not going around in circles. You can walk forward because Jesus is impelling you, propelling you, compelling you to make forward progress and not retrograde progress. Here's the key for forward momentum as a Christian believer. The Spirit. It's the Spirit that we need. You may have a blender or a toaster or some such thing sitting on your kitchen counter. And if it sits there, it's only an ornament until you plug it in and flip it on. Then it roars to life. Without the power, it's as good as a paperweight. But with the power, it can do what it was designed to do. You have been designed to bear fruit for the glory of God. And you can navel gaze and feel bad about your lack. Or you can stare towards heaven and say, that's where the power is. If that Jesus would fill my heart with his presence. How does that happen? It's not theory. This is the practice, the practicalities of Christianity. Jesus wants to possess your life through the person of the Holy Spirit. His Spirit comes into your life. You're not the same again. You cannot be going backwards. This is Jesus. He's driving you forward. One man sank into the water. His name was Peter. He denied Jesus. Oh, what a coward. No, he was just in the flesh. And then when he was in the Spirit, the authority said, Silence, man. And he said, We cannot be quiet. Who are here and who are happily unconverted? This question is not for you. This is for the one in five who are converted. And that question is, to the converted among us, do you ever make mistakes? Amen. You see? 
And you make mistakes when what happens? I'm fishing for a right answer here, but, but I'm not talking about a certain behavior or practice. But what is it that leads a person to stumble and, and flop? It's taking your eyes where? Off Jesus. So the person who does what he or she does not want to do and doesn't do what he or she does want to do, why didn't he write it in an easier way to discuss? It's not so much whether you're converted or otherwise, although I'll grant that's a factor. That person who's doing what she doesn't want to do and not doing what he wants to do is simply, a, it's anyone who isn't filled at that moment with the Spirit of God. It's anyone who takes their eyes off Jesus. Peter, good old Peter, after his fall from grace, he was strengthened by God and, and wrote books of the Bible and he was a leader in the church. And yet he was kissing up to the Jews to the extent that Paul said he had to come and withstand him to the face. Paul rebuked him. Because in that moment, Peter, for whatever reason, cared more about what people were saying than what Scripture teaches and what the Spirit of God was doing. So what you see is that people can stumble. People can fall. And typically that's because people aren't yet the finished product. And so we're growing. So over here in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I find myself doing what I don't want to do. I find myself wanting to do what I'm not capable of doing. He says, a wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Imagine if that's where the book of Romans ended. Oh, God help us. Imagine if that's where it ended. But it doesn't end there. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says one other little thing, and then Romans 8 and verse 1. Okay, Romans 7. I, I bumble and I stumble. I do what I shouldn't. I don't do what I should. I, I, I'm, I'm a failure. I feel so bad. And Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. What do you mean by that? He explains it who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If we are going to walk forward at all, we walk after the Spirit. How do we get that? We ask. And when we ask, God gives. And then we surrender. Not my will, Lord, your will be done. You get to a fork in your spiritual road. I don't know what to do, but you do. And I will go where you lead. That's all right with me. We get to a place and we know what we want to do. Oh, this is tough. And we cry out to God. Okay, Lord, give me grace. Not my will, your will. And the impossible becomes possible. Because as was said earlier by uh, the, the principal of the school, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is God who does the work in our lives that needs to be done. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. How does he do that? How do we walk forward in the, in, in, with Jesus? Through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So if you can just be sensible enough to pray the prayer and, and say, God, give me your Holy Spirit today. You will see amazing things happen. And it's not a one and done. Don't pray that at 6.20 in the morning and then forget about Jesus the rest of the day. Keep in touch with God. But the more you pray, the more you pray. The more you call out to God, the more you call out to God. The more you reach out and grab hold of his hand, the more constantly you will hang on to his hand. We want to walk forward and there's only one way forward and that is with Jesus, you understand. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus did it. Jesus paid it. Jesus triumphed. Jesus was victorious. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk. Not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And it's interesting, that word, that word walk that you read again and again and again and again in the New Testament, the word walk, it means, funny enough, to walk. <laughs> walk in a line, maybe like march forward. It means forward progress. The, word is, the Greek word is 
peripateo, where we get the English word today, peripatetic, which you might call a, a kind of a, a wandering existence, the peripatetic existence of someone in the military. You're kind of constantly on the move. And here the Bible is talking about walking, peripateo, being constantly on the move. For verse 5 says, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You're going to walk forward? Walk in the Spirit. How do I get the Spirit? Ask. And then what? Believe. And then what? Expect God to do His thing. There's a temptation that's bugging you, and you know it's bugging you, and you hate it, and you want to go forward and not backwards. It's like you're doing okay, and then along comes this temptation. It is like a hurricane or a tornado. It'll pick you up and take you backwards. Oh, no, no, no. That's when you cry out to God and say, Lord, I'll fall. As sure as night follows day, I will fall here unless you do something great. I cannot go forward. It's too big. But not for you, it's not. So God, open the way. Lead me forward. Give me your grace. And before you know it, the roadblock is gone, and you've made you're walking forward, not backwards. This is what Jesus will do. I want to see if I can make it ever so slightly more practical for you. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness. He tries something called righteousness by flattery. Oh, teacher, we know that you must be sent from God because no one can do the impressive things that you do. And Jesus is like, oh, forget it, man. You must be born again. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, now he tries righteousness by stupidity. Oh, you think I got to go back inside my mother's womb and be born all over again? No one, the story doesn't mention that his mother was standing eight feet ago and she went eight, eight feet away. <laughs> Bad enough the first time, Nico. <laughs> Jesus said, you got to be born of water and of the spirit. Nicodemus is saying, huh? Oh, he knew. It was just bigger than he could imagine. Nicodemus was trying to get to the how. Because he knew that he had a hard heart and that he was a proud Pharisee. And so Jesus gave him the how. He said, you know, it's a bit like when Moses was in the wilderness and he raised that serpent up. What was that about? The question is, how am I to be born again? Jesus said, remember the serpent in the wilderness. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. How am I to be born again? Remember the serpent in the wilderness. So if you go back to Numbers chapter 21. They're moaning and complaining and as they wander through the wilderness. And God says, I'll get your attention. And he sent venomous snakes in their midst. Many of the people were bitten and they began to die. It's Numbers chapter 21. And what's fascinating about this is that they come to Moses and they say, oh, Moses, you've got to help us. And Moses did. He went to the Lord. He prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. It will come to pass that everyone that's bitten when he looks upon it shall live. So here they were infected by the, the venom of sin. They were dying. God said, I have a solution. I, I want you to go from dying to living. Here's all I want you to do. I want you to look. Look with faith. Why is it a serpent? Because Jesus became sin for us. Look to the crucified Jesus, the snake on a pole. That was the Savior on a cross. Look to him. And the most amazing thing happened. When they looked at the snake on the pole, they lived. There it is. That's to be born again. That's to walk with Jesus. That's to receive the Spirit of God into your life. Where are you looking? If you're looking to Jesus, you're going to be receiving from Jesus and experience his power. If, you, if it's one part Jesus and 15 parts Netflix, you're going to wonder why it's like driving in a car with no air in the tires. You're going to wonder why. It's just because you're looking in the wrong places. You understand that by beholding, we become changed. What we focus on is what we turn into. It's, it's, it's just how it is in life and everything. Uh, if you study neuroplasticity, the, the scientists will tell you that your brain is literally changed by what you focus on. It's remade and rewired based on what you focus on. That's what the apostle wrote two millennia ago. 
It's a scientific fact. If you look to Jesus, it will change your brain. It'll make you into something new. It'll rewire your thinking and your mind. It will have a transformative effect. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole. It came to pass that if a, certain, a serpent had bitten anyone, when that person looked at the serpent of brass, he lived. And here's what's interesting. The next verse says, And the children of Israel set forward. I just love it. After they were healed, forward momentum again. Even when you fall, let Jesus forgive you. Forward momentum again. We are walking forward. How is it with you today, friend? Are you walking with Jesus? Are you walking forward? You're not going around and around in circles, are you? Well, if you are, that's why you're here today. Because now we're going to do something about that. We're going to look to Jesus and we're going to receive his spirit. And no, you're not going to get a confirmation email. It's written in the Bible. This is the confirmation email. When you believe, you receive. It's as simple as that. When you believe, you receive. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's the power of faith, which is, frankly, very positive thinking. No more backwards, because we're going to look to Jesus. No more circular motion. It's onwards and upwards now, because we are looking to Jesus. We get ourselves confused sometimes. You know the Euros are on right now, the European Soccer Cup or something or other. European Football Championship. A group of fans from France was really keen to, say, to see their team, France, play against Hungary. And so they got in a car and they drove to Bucharest to watch France play Hungary. What's the problem? Bucharest is in Romania. They made the same mistake you did. They turned up and no, they, they flew as a matter of fact. They got a transfer from Bucharest, to, I don't know why, they never saw the sign saying, welcome to Romania. Traveled downtown Bucharest, went to a bar and then figured it out. Wrong country. It's happened before, a few years ago, some Bill Bow supporters chartered a plane and flew to Bucharest instead of Budapest. Some Belgian soccer supporters wanted to see Belgium play Wales. So they got their sat-nav out, that's what they call a GPS over there, and they typed in Wales and drove to Wales. Well, they really needed to be going to Cardiff in the country of Wales. Instead, they went to the village of Wales near Sheffield in South Yorkshire. There's not even a soccer field there, just a cricket pitch. Thankfully, they were only 200 miles out of their way. I guess they probably made it for the game. They were heading in the wrong direction. We might be doing the same thing. We're about walking forward as Christians, not backwards. Walking where God wants us to go, not getting off course. Why don't we settle it in our hearts today? Jesus, we know where we're going. We sure don't want to end up in the wrong place. We need your guidance, your spirit, your remaking. Give me grace to walk forward. I want to walk with Jesus. We're going to pray that prayer right now, our Father in heaven. We're thankful today for the promises in your word, for the provisions of scripture, for the grace that is resident in your heart, for the power in your spirit, for the assurance that we can have heaven even now. Friend of God, is it your prayer to walk forward? You know now what it takes for us is to be filled with the Spirit of God. We want not, Lord, to walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who do so. We don't expect that we will never put a foot wrong. But we do expect that we will grow more and more and more and more. And we believe that you can do in us that which without you is absolutely impossible. We ask your blessing. We pray your will be done. And we pray you would fill us with your spirit. I've got to ask you if that's your prayer. Would your prayer today be, Lord, fill me with your spirit? If it is, would you raise your hand? Just lift it up. God, fill me with your spirit. I want to walk forward and not backwards. Keep us, dear God. We accept the gift of your spirit. 
We believe it by faith. We love you and we wish to love you more. And we pray this prayer of acceptance of your spirit in Jesus' loving name. Please say, Amen. Amen.